Ready? Indeed. Okay. Studio Buddies Doing a podcast With a gay guitar <laughs> Hello and welcome to Studio Buddies Podcast Featuring me, Simon And I am Jamie And this is where we talk for you to enjoy <laughs> In copious amounts, absolutely Indeed This is the outlet for us we are both uh, fine arts students in the same year. We're in our second year, just turning into the third year now. Yeah, so this was something we decided to do over summer, because why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, to introduce ourselves, um, I am uh, fairly new to art to the extent that I haven't drawn all of my life or painted, and I started about... Was it about seven years ago, I think? Um, before that, I did bits of music, uh, maybe production stuff, and kind of artsy creative stuff, but nothing really too deep with the drawing and painting. Uh, my brother's an artist, so I always had that influence of going to galleries and exhibitions and um, interesting bookshops where they'd have art books and things. And I've always, you know, been interested in different types of art. So I thought I'd try fine art and um, it's been different than I expected, but yeah, so mm. far, I'm kind of questioning everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <How about you? laughs> um, okay, so I started drawing when I think I was around nine, ten-ish, because my dad used to draw, so we'd have like little uh, drawing competitions and stuff. Um, mm. And then I studied art in high school, uh, college, and now university. Um, Before, sorry, can I interrupt you already? You're already way more interested than I am, so I just want to know, <laughs> the drawing competition with you and your dad, that sounds amazing. Do you have any any drawings still, or do you remember things about that? Yeah, I, um, I still have an old sketchbook that I used um, back, like, when I was around that age, um, and I think somewhere I have one of his drawings I'm not sure where but like the competitions that we'd have they'd be pretty weird because like I have aphantasia so I can't visualize anything and he'd be like okay I want you to draw a crab apple um, but the way he would do it is he'd draw an apple with like crab limbs Legs and stuff and, limbs, and we'd yeah. yeah we'd see whose was better and it wasn't mine <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So yeah, so Aphantasia is an interesting one to touch upon, but would, to be fair, I interrupted you in your introduction to yourself, so I'll let you continue. Um, <laughs> I'm crap, sorry. where was I? <laughs> it's yeah, alright. Well, I mean, if you go from after doing the drawing competitions with your dad, because I think, I forgot what you said after that, because I just thought, I'm going to have to stop you, that already sounds fun. And cool, um, yeah, crab apple's great. Yeah, so um, I that's kind of how like I got into drawing and stuff. Um, so I would draw in my free time, and I remember doing like SpongeBob. Uh, oh, amazing! <laughs> uh, yeah, and like coloured pencil, um, and then I studied it in high school, and then that progressed into like college studying it for A levels. Uh, then I did a foundation diploma in art and design. And uh, now I'm in university. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of gone from, um, I mean, if Spongebob was a thing that you remember drawing early, it's kind of cartoon character. And I love Spongebob, the, you know, cartoon. I think it's an amazing. I watch it like, you know, people watch The Wire or Breaking Bad or something. I'll just watch it yeah. for the first episode and go, right, I'm up to season two. What happens in season two? Not like it's serialised, but it's just an amazing, absurdist surrealist cartoon really and uh if you went from drawing that type of thing where did your how did your drawing develop from a more cartoony style to where you are at the moment because you've, you've explored different things haven't you um i think is it that was a bit maybe... of a weird question yeah um i think it was it was mainly in high school and stuff because it would be like um like still life studies of shells and stuff like that so I went from like drawing cartoons well like copying cartoons essentially 
to then um, doing still life and then every now and again there would be you know like a little lesson on cubism and mm -hmm. stuff like that or like a lesson on painting um, but and it high was like is that? Is, yeah. Is that yeah well that was high school so uh, that was very like still life heavy um, and then college it was kind of more exploring like different materials and things so like <clears throat> um, ink work and like batik, uh, printmaking, um, stuff like that and then when I did foundation that was more of like exploring mediums so I even did weaving at one point, um, hey. yeah, wow. that was quite fun, I enjoyed that. Um, this is all stuff which I was hoping I'd do in uni, so I think I just didn't, because I skipped out on education, I didn't really see what art students were doing in A-level. It's possibly why I've had such a jarring introduction to what university curriculum is sort of, you know, fitting you into, really. And uh, But yeah, that sounds amazing. So, I mean, it is kind of like, yeah, that's why I couldn't see why how you could get from Spongebob to where you are now, because I didn't, didn't realise what gets taught, so that's... Yeah. That sounds amazing with like weaving and printmaking is, uh, I mean, do you have this stuff like photographs still? Do you have a bit of a backlog? Of yeah, stuff? I've got my, um, I've still got all of my sketchbooks. Um, I still have the pieces uh, that I did for an exhibition for my final major project in college. Um, so I've got like all of that just in a cupboard, <clears throat> um, which is like pretty deep, like photography and stuff. Um, but yeah, I've still got all of my, my sketchbooks, I, I hold them. That's amazing though, I'm jealous, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've even got the one uh, from year 11 high school. Yeah. Yeah, wow. and every now and again I look back at it and just laugh. <laughs> that must be nice, cause, I mean you've done such, I mean, yeah, so like I, I said to you before is that when I first met you in first year, um, I hadn't really realised who was, you know, who was capable in figurative work and who wasn't because of the work we were doing. And I just saw how much um, everyone was just putting into whatever we were doing. So I felt like, if anything, the least contributor of everything because everything felt kind of uh, drill bits of, uh, uh, what's it called, um, kind of receipt ribbon or whatever you'd call it, you know, from receipts, from till receipts. Um, yeah or um you know kind of just random things where it's like just do it quick with mark making and i thought we must be going into longer studies and then it just diverted into different places where i'd only see bits of figurative glimpses from people from the painting tutor um and again because of what we were doing you hadn't really managed to kind of get something where you'd really shown your ability with rendering 3d spaces because it was so abstract that we were being lent towards anyway yeah it just didn't didn't sort of encourage that type of expression so when i did see how well you can draw and paint it was surprising so i mean you must see this amazing you know kind of early on crab apple <laughs> attempts it but i mean we, again it, it's i'm tempted to go into the a fantasia but there's a lot to talk about so yeah it's first like i suppose yeah yeah i don't know is there anything you want to say about any of that at all I think the reason, like, I think my aphantasia is one of the reasons why I definitely struggled with uni first year, um, because, you know, it was really abstract things and that's not how my brain works. I have to go from reference images. So for someone to be like, just do something, I'm just like, but what? Like, <laughs> the, nothing is happening. I can't do anything. Um, yeah. So that was like one of the reasons why I just, I didn't do anything first year and like some of the modules, they just, they didn't make sense and I'm dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> so it just didn't make sense. Um, and you know, like they weren't very understanding towards like my ADHD and stuff like that, um, yeah. which wasn't too great. But then like second year, because I think for second year, we got a lot more freedom to do you know the subjects that we wanted to do so and yeah I'll like pull a painting out of my day and that's exactly what I did for like three months <laughs> yeah that's amazing yeah it's I mean it's such an amount of 
again detailed work and texture work which I'd just not seen anything like that from anyone because everything which people did was quite fast and loose and the stuff I was doing was fast and loose and I just thought I'm really missing out on any kind of refinement and I was hoping that someone would come in and say here's a, a lesson on cutting in or something like that because I know cutting in a little bit yeah but as soon as someone teaches it you've been taught it officially where you know I could have taught the gist of perspective before Steve came in and taught actual perspective just for get the straight ahead one point single point perspective and create a, an imaginary room where everything's falling into that and then the gist of it is all of your vanishing points can just skew from there because you get the principle yeah so I really like that because it was enough to give me a comprehensive structure for something which I was just ballparking a lot of the time just kind of going I'll be in the realms of where it is but I, because I didn't know how vanishing points were truly followed and worked I can now notice in in my work leading up to uni how many things didn't follow those rules you know yeah which, which made it really valuable that was I always mention that as one of the most valuable lessons I've had is something which you probably got taught in high school but a lot of people didn't seem to get no uh perspective was taught in college um and it wasn't taught in a level it was taught in my foundation diploma um we yeah. had i think it was three days about perspective and it was um yeah i remember it being quite boring for me because <laughs> we literally mm. just had like a cardboard box and he was like yeah we need to do the vanishing points and all like you know put it in perspective and stuff um but like when I think back about it, it was, you know, it was a really valuable thing for me to learn anyway. Um, mm. So I'm quite grateful for doing my foundation, to be honest, because the amount of stuff that I learned in comparison with uni, like it was insane. Yeah. It was a very yeah. intense course. Like you had to go home and do multiple sketchbook pages a day, otherwise you'd fail. Amazing. I mean, I'd like that type of pressure practically. I mean, because they do suggest that you just dive into it in university and don't get me wrong they wouldn't have to do a massive amount more for me to be completely ready to commit to everything and I've not had that because of um, their lack of kind of involvement with who you are and what directions are actually going to help you as opposed to saying oh right you're doing this it kind of reminds me of this person here's this person and then you might want to look at this it's kind of like, okay, and you look at the things and then you go, okay, so should I study there? I mean, are we going to have a conversation? Is there any, because I mean, with John, the painting tutor, I feel like when I have private tutoring sessions with him, if I ask him a question, he'll tell me the answer and I'll write down the notes, the names that yeah. he'll tell about and talk about the actual philosophy behind it. Like I said, one of the most powerful things he said to me on the phone was, uh, um, I was trying to reconcile a uh, heavy concept in fine art and trying to weave in something that is... Um, wait a minute, what were you saying? You were saying about John... Um, oh, yeah. I've lost the track of what you were saying now. Um, I said... Oh, yeah, it was about um, how a lot of the time artists aren't actually producing anything. and That's right. You know, they're not, like... They're not painting on a daily basis. They're not you know, constantly coming up with new ideas and new things. And he said it gets to a point in your creative career where you just, you go to this place where everything makes sense. And, you know, the ideas that you have, they become so clear and you know exactly what you want to do. You know exactly how you want to do it. And it's just when you get to that place that, you know, everything kind of just, falls in line and it's like it's like you know when the fog clears and you can see again it's like that mm. and he said like you know don't worry about not producing anything right now because you know in a month time you could be producing so much because you've finally been to this place and you finally understand what it is you want to do and that was that was amazing yeah it makes it the whole course worthwhile to have someone like that, isn't it, really? Yeah. Uh, losing Steve felt like losing another, you know, pillar of that type of 
investment, you know, in the students to sort of say, I'm going to tell you the truth as, as I know it. Yeah. Because of my experience in the industry and what I think is honestly going to help you. And that's really valuable because there's, you know, I'd say we have four tutors and a dean and uh, one of those four tutors is is worth it, really. And, um, and I don't dislike, I try to not dislike the people, even though it's easy to. We have discussed a tendency to people to rub you wrong um they'll rub you the wrong way not sexual that's the wrong way to rub me no it's they'll rub me the wrong way it's still like a weird expression oh yeah so yeah um whereas john rubs me the right way <laughs> i'm gonna tell wrong. him so yeah <laughs> simon says you Rubbing the right way. <laughs> you just go, well, I'm not going to be speaking to Simon anymore, actually. <laughs> We're cutting off communication. Well, I think that I hope was that we inappropriate. Don't lose John from the course. <laughs> I know. I know. He's a little gem. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. He's completely captivated by that world of painting, creating things that he's seen. Because he's created that world that is his work, is recognisable as a world that, that he's built. It is something which you can yeah. just see as comforting and is love to talk about, which is, uh, you know, for me it was really inspiring to see and lovely, and especially if he started to introduce demonstrating, you know, bits of uh, things that he does his process. I mean, there's nothing nicer than to see someone who makes paintings often just do things as casually as they do them. And uh, as you know, I had a, a friend, yeah. a figurative artist, who I'd uh, hang around with a lot and watch, watch her do painting. And it's such delicate, amazing work that it was amazing to see her go up to a painting, dip some, um, what was it now that she did to it? It, was, uh, it wasn't varnishing, it was, um, oh God, I should think of this properly. But it was glazing, that's what she was doing. She was glazing over a painting and she'd have, it's all oil painting, she doesn't work with acrylic. An amazing yeah. decorative uh, painter, but, and she had this, painting that just the water was quite flat blue tones and she'd got this brush which had got bits of paint in it but she'd got loads of linseed oil built up on it and just taking out the paint and just completely slapped it around <laughs> like, like the, the kind of violence of the stroke I just watched going oh my god I can't believe how she's approaching this and it just became this magic that all these tones came out of this blue and she wasn't, you yeah. know, all over the painting, like she is very controlled chaos in the stroke. But um, yeah, uh, when I saw that, I thought there's magic to painting that we don't see from colour theory and just from skilled application. There's just these tricks. And we had hints of that with uh, John teaching us about acrylic inks was a nice um, yeah. glazing concept, which I might try and reuse. You know? Oh, definitely. It's something that I'm going to I'm going to reuse again. Hmm. It's very concept based. I don't do much of that. And that's something which I try to figure out all the time. When I look at paintings that I'm doing, I don't know if it's in frame. No, it's not in frame, but there's a painting just above me anyway. And um, and it's all half finished, um, not even half finished. It's just had two sessions, I think it's had or three. And um, it's just something where I think once it's done, I don't know what I'm trying to say outside of this is shapes and structures and things which I think reflect with colour and dynamism that could mean more to other people. But for me, it's just something that I want to create because I quite like abstract shapes in architecture and things and in nature, you know, because shape design is something which I'm really influenced by. I really don't know what, what I'm focused on otherwise because you did mention about going through what we're focusing on. What would you say your you're focusing on with your art uh mental health uh it has been mental health for the past year um and you know with the current climate um people's mental health isn't that great um and i still feel like there's a stigma attached to people that are suffering with mental health issues yeah. um but i i don't know i have this weird thing where unless i'm really passionate about it I won't do it like if it if I'm not passionate it's not gonna happen um and I think that's just you know ADHD brain um but it, 
you know, I've covered uh, quite a few things in terms of mental health, so like medication and um, stuff like that, like the medication that I have to take for my mental health. Um, death, that was another one and how like that kind of affected me. Um, and then <laughs> death again. <laughs> Um, and then kind of like after all of that it was trying to actually actively improve my own mental health um, and kind of you know like the objects that I associate with feeling happy um, and stuff like that um, yeah yeah it's I mean it's yeah. really deep um, and kind of like you said very it's always going to be a contemporary issue isn't it you know is mental health and yeah. death is not something that is a new phenomenon it's not something that's going away and uh, no. and it's funny because when not only when I met you but always when I talk to you you have such a sunny disposition and you kind of bring such brightness into the into the rooms that you enter and uh and it's, it's kind all of a so, lie it's very <laughs> <laughs> well it's certainly all a very nice person to meet behind such deep you know subjects and I think that, yeah, that's where I struggle is that I don't have a massive amount of depth that I'm either willing to tap into or that is just there to say, this is what you want to talk about. So yeah. I usually feel like my subject matter is always studies. And I'm just like, it's so empty. It's such a, you know, I like the look of this. I think this is cool. This is bits of the world that the way I see it, I don't really know what I'm going for. So for you to have specific resonant, you know, subjects. Yeah. But, like, don't get me wrong, um, <laughs> even though mental health is obviously something I'm very passionate about, there are times where it's so, like, it's so upsetting just to do the work that I produce. Like, especially with um, my exhibition that I did for my foundation diploma. I'll send you the images. Um, just going to put this here now. It's a trigger warning for self-harm. Um, so... If you're currently watching it and you get triggered by that, look away. I won't be offended because it was quite triggering. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, exploring stuff like that, it was... As much as I really wanted to do it, after I did, I'd have to have, like, a significant break because my brain was just so fried and I'd end up, like, you know, I'd spiral a little bit, which isn't necessarily healthy. Um, but I feel like now because I don't know because my mental health is a lot better than it was like back then I'm able to to kind of process it better and I'm able to actually use it instead of you know just expressing it and then feeling the aftermath after you know I don't know if that makes sense it does make sense so I was thinking that it's it's something which you hope is going to be therapeutic but it should be kind of like a therapeutic process making art and it's when you invest that much truth into it for to, to feel depleted afterwards is you know it's natural and it makes sense but at the same time it's uh it's unfortunate to sort of hear that it's kind of takes a lot from you which it will do i suppose it's energy that you're investing into something but it's yeah. still uh, it's a big thing to tackle each time you're doing a piece and i've seen the work that we're going to put up on the podcast but it's um and incredibly powerful i love the work but it's um Thank you. taking a toll like that is it's a big price it's a serious price isn't it yeah but i i feel like it's important like even if i'm the one that has to pay that price it's important for me to do it because i feel like not like you know we've come a long way since way back when um but it's still not talked about enough. It's still not recognised enough. And, like, I will push this until the day I die and I will happily do it. And, you know, on my deathbed, I will be proud of myself because I'm trying to make a difference and I'm trying to, you know, end the stigma of taking medication. Like, yeah. like you wouldn't look at someone that takes, like, heart medication and be like... <laughs> really you need that to survive <laughs> pathetic like you wouldn't do it so why no. are you doing it for mental health like yeah. just because you can't see it doesn't mean it isn't there and there's so many people now that are affected by mental health especially with you know current climate yeah. um that 
you know, it, it still needs to it still needs to be recognised yeah. and understood and accepted because it's not gonna go away. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Yeah, yeah it's it, it is something which we have weird stigmas about where it seems quite juvenile uh, logic which is used to other people who are struggling in ways that I don't even think that it's things that we can't relate to because I feel like part of the um, reaction and the kind of uh, repulsion to that is because you identify that part of it and it's possibly an anxiety um, yeah. about you know seeing yourself in someone who's you know struggling and, and deserves sympathy and help but instead, you know, much like with homeless people, where you see people go, oh, I don't even want to look. I just walk away, walk past them. And you just think, well, these are people. They should be people first as opposed to homeless people. They should be people who are unhoused or people who are homeless, just so that the language describes people first, you know, because it's, again, part of the way that we've kind of, you know, grown up and got used to the world is with certain terms. Yeah. And then questioning those at a point where you know enough to say, this doesn't really do justice to the actual truth of what, what it's trying to describe. And to the, you know, the amount of people who suffer, not that, you know, as if percentages would make it more important, but it should be more compelling because it's not a, a fringe issue. You know, it's prevalent in, you know, all areas of society, all countries all over the world. Yeah. Wait, what was it? I don't know, I just made some random statement that ended and then I looked to you going, yeah, that was the statement. <laughs> Sometimes I try to end with a, a natural thing. Sorry about this, folks. Still trying to get the rhythm here. Apologise for my uh, weird waffle. It's going to happen. I appreciate your weird waffle. It keeps me sane. Merchandise available. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Studio Buddies podcast. So, so like, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. What is your um, your medium of choice? If if you had to pick just one medium and that was the only medium you could use for the rest of your life, what would it be? You see, I'm tempted to say ink, and I'd even just go black ink because I'm so enamoured with black ink and what I've learned with it. And I just feel like I'm just scratching the surface. I mean, literally with a pen, just scratching the surface with learning how to make that better and more powerful with less marks yeah and if you're going to add more marks make those each one of those marks beautiful so that's why i think i could spend the rest of my life with ink quite happily um but i really would feel like I've, i still haven't learned the pencil or the paintbrush that's why i'm not as inclined to experiment with making paints paintings with other instruments and tools because um I haven't tried palette knives yet. You know, I've only done oil painting, mm. I think, twice or three times in my life. So I'm, I just feel like we're, we're kind of missing a lot, or I'm certainly missing a lot, which I think is important to me. Um, with the current situation, as we've mentioned, it's, um, it's not as easy as well to kind of do those things. I think I assumed that was going to be something that I'd just take to uni. Yeah. And in an ideal world, be able to leave a certain amount at uni, but it became... You know, much like a lot of the rest of the things where I grow up, where you don't you don't leave things in a place because it's, you can't you can't trust your yeah. your neighbours, unfortunately. Yeah. So sorry, that's my weird answer of saying ink. <laughs> nice. <laughs> black ink. <laughs> I do love a yeah. good black ink, though. But I mean, you because you've been excelling with painting. I mean, are you uh, more paints orientated uh, oriented now? Yeah. Than. Any other medium, yeah. Yeah, acrylic. So jealous. Acrylic paint is my go-to. Um, I don't know why. I just love it. it I, yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> have you tried or heard of ac acrylic gouache? I have used acrylic gouache. Yeah. Um, we What's used it, like? it. We used it in foundation. Um, I think it was just a little bit more watery than acrylic I think is that all it is yeah and like the texture was different and you know the finish mm. was different um but every single time I'd you know I'd explore like oil and watercolor acrylic I'd just end up going back to it yeah yeah it's a I mean that's what I started with was acrylic and then I learned 
a bit of watercolour recently and then I tried gouache because I watched uh, a guy on YouTube called James Gurney, an old guy who's an amazing, I should call him an old guy, sorry James Gurney if you ever do see this, I don't think James Gurney would ever see this, but he's a, a fantastic older artist gentleman who um, he uses gouache and watercolour all the time, which I didn't realise gouache is opaque watercolour. Yeah. So it's literally just flat watercolour. Um, and I loved it when I've used gouache once. I thought it was really nice because I quite like solid shapes that you can block in. Because again, I love shape design. Um, so yeah, I quite liked it. I haven't used acrylic gouache. My brother's just got a set, an expensive set. And he said that he's bought too much. He's got like a desk full of acrylic oh, gouache. Oh God. <laughs> I, He'll figure out it's just watery acrylic at some point and go, no, I just need more acrylic in that. It's just not thick enough. I don't know. I think it was just the, the consistency that kind of threw me off with it because I was so used to acrylic. And, you know, like acrylic can be quite thick if you want it to be. Um, and then to go from using acrylic to acrylic gouache, I was like, ah, nah, nah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a... Once you get used to acrylic, I suppose there's a lot to be done there, isn't there? I mean, have you used different um, priced acrylics, more expensive acrylics as well? Yeah, I um, I I have used, you know, the acrylic that you can get from the works, like the dirt cheap acrylics. Like, don't get me wrong, hmm. I still like them. Controversial opinion. Um, <laughs> and I've also used Galleria. I really like Galleria. Um, I think, oh, and I've also used Liquitex Heavy Body Acrylic, quite enjoyed that as well, but... I was going to say, that sounds more expensive, the Liquitex. It costs a bomb, like, <laughs> oh, and like, the Heavy Body one, that is thick, like, mm. but yeah. Pigment rich as well, isn't it? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. but I think like, as a uni student, I probably shouldn't just be using Liquitex Heavy Body because I don't sell anything, <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> and you use a lot, don't you, in the kind of experimentation phase? I mean, I just use Galleria almost exclusively yeah. because it's a medium-priced acrylic that's pretty good, I reckon. Yeah. It's just, uh, I don't love... I mean, when I got the richer um, pigmented acrylic, I loved it, but it compared to my other paintings, it doesn't look like the colours that I'm trying to get. It's a bit too vibrant for me, I think. I quite like the flatness. I think I'm a bit of a Tintin fan. You know, like that kind of yeah. colour that looks like it's got a you know, fade to it. I do quite oh, like colour. vibrant colours, though. Mm. Yeah. And, like, to be honest, I think, you know, if you want to start off with acrylics, there's nothing wrong with getting acrylics from the works because I'll hold my hands up. I still use them, okay? So... The works is like, it's all sort of the equivalent of getting a, just a cheap art set from any stationery shop really, isn't it? Where you can kind of get a cheap set of acrylics, but it's if it's colours that you can still manipulate from what you know, yeah. the only difference you're going to see is if you get, you know, a colour which is super watery and then you just need more and more of it, which can usually, am I wrong in thinking that's usually the white, which is the more watery one or have you had different ones? Um... I, to be honest, I think for the works ones, the consistency of the paint is typically the same. Like, they don't, you know, it, really? yeah, it's pretty consistent all around. Every now and again, the black is a little bit patchy. So if you're literally just going in with black, you will need, like, multiple coats. But I think, you know, you should probably use multiple coats anyway, just to be on the safe side. So mm. for me, it doesn't really impact much because I layer on acrylic paint like it doesn't cost anything <laughs> so I think that's quite nice I'm always quite a fan of over painting as they call it or just not being quite so precious but I do at the same time have an appreciation for the uh, the kind of school of thought which I learned of at the Bernard Willems Art Academy locally to me which I attended for a year where he would say you don't get paid by the ounce or the gram, I think he said. Like, you, know, you get paid by the gram, which, don't get me wrong, he didn't teach that and he didn't actually say it. He said that to the students I was learning, you know, among, because he was uh, in his late 90s by the time I joined. But, um, yeah, it was quite a, 
when I did sit and speak to him when I first joined and I went through a big folder of his drawings, I saw one which was the waves yeah. uh, crashing. And it was an amazing avoidance of where the white, you know, is. And you just think, how do you create those shapes which describe waves? And I, I sort of, so I thought to ask him, I said, you know, are you using an eraser to get these shapes? And, uh, and he had a, a lovely Belgian accent, which I won't mimic, but it's kind of like a, you know, almost a French kind of thing where he was, you know, just sort of like, you know, don't, not to use a rubber. But I did ask someone afterwards and he said he did use a rubber, but not for that drawing necessarily. But he's not anti eraser on, on drawings, you know, it was just, I think he's trying to say that you learn. You learn to avoid those things to kind of develop tone to describe stuff. You know, the technical, masterful, yeah. delicate rendering stuff. I'm quite a fan of that as well. I'm not as close-minded as I come off, as I come across in, in university, where I'm, I don't know, struggling to really get into some of the things because I just think we've not really exhausted. I don't. I don't know how to even explain it anymore. You know what I mean? Where I feel like we've kind of cut a lot of corners and got to a place where it's like, it's time to now just express yourself. Yeah. <laughs> go, well, but then when you when you actually it. express yourself and, you know, you, you produce a piece of work, it's frowned upon, almost. Yeah. And then it's like, well, what was the point then? Yeah. I mean, I, was, I don't know if you remember this, but when... Steve um, first sat down for a um, perspective class. He said to the group, does anyone here understand perspective? And I put my hand up. And he said, there's always one, isn't there? <laughs> because nobody else put their hand up. And I was shocked. I was like, does nobody else understand perspective? I was like, okay. And then he came round. I showed him my sketchbook. And um, he said, oh, you get it. Because it looks like I get it. And I kind of didn't. That was the funny thing is that I just learned how to kind of do it. So that was one example. And then when John was in the studio one time saying, <coughs> does anyone here think there's such a thing as bad art? And I put my hand up unashamedly. I was like, yeah, absolutely it's bad yeah. art. <laughs> he was like, oh. And he was just a bit, because everyone was a bit like, how could you possibly say such a thing as bad art? I was like, Cause of course there is. <laughs> well, when has this idea come about that there's no such thing as bad art? Like, whose feelings are we trying to protect where saying the art isn't good is hurting the person? I mean, that's just a misunderstanding. We're not judging the artist. We're just saying that piece is not They're, good. Right, okay. Yeah. I'm part of a Facebook group. I'm not going to say its name. Um, and mm. I, I post some of my artwork on there, you know, and I... As much as I can pick apart my own work, I am proud of the progress I've made, so I'm happy to share it. And um, I noticed in this group, right, my post didn't get that much attention, and it doesn't bother me. Like, you know, I don't have much of an online presence anyway. Um, so I was just like, right, okay, that's fine. And the, you know, the few people that took the time to like comment on it, you know, I was, I was having nice conversations with them. And then there was this one post I saw, right, and it was a portrait. And it genuinely looked like a portrait that I had done when I was 12, okay? The perspective was way off. The proportions, shocking, right? And it was literally, it looked like, you know when a child does a drawing and they hold the pencil like that? And they're just like, yeah. it was like <laughs> that, okay? This post got so many likes and so many people were like, it's amazing. And I'm just like, it's absolutely shocking. Like, I'm sorry. What? Yeah. What? It's madness. It's, it's absolute madness that people will look to support people. And I, don't get me wrong, supporting people I'm all for, but in a weird over the yeah. top way where you just think, what am I missing here? Because I don't think I'm yeah. missing. I mean, I've spoken to that art, you know friend of mine who i mentioned earlier and she even said oh you know every art is quite and i showed her something once where i said this is a professional artist she's been interviewed recently by someone who i'm a fan of so i watched her and she's lovely in the in the interview so i was like really yeah. love it looked at her art and i said i don't get it and then this friend of mine said oh i can't wait i'd, I'd love to be described as art that people someone doesn't get and i was like here you go showed it to her and she goes yeah 
Oh yeah, no, I don't care. Just pulled a face like, what the hell? And I was like, exactly. You can't sort of say as a point of pride, I want people to not get me. No, you don't. You want people to resonate with some aspect of your work yeah. and to not go same old, same old. Because, you know, we do have a lot of same old stuff and I'm not producing anything that's changing the landscape, but I'm trying to work towards my voice specifically. And that's what we're all trying to, to kind of hone, I, I think. This this post, there were so many comments where people were like, oh yeah, this is amazing. And like the way I described it, I'm not exaggerating, that is literally what it looked like. And I remember reading the comments and I was like, like, I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's not amazing though, is it? Because my little brother could do better and he's 12. <laughs> like, what? And just the, I mean, uh, it was so mind boggling because the amount of people that were just like, trying to hype it up for something that it wasn't you know and it was just weird yeah. it was really weird i mean have you seen the portrait artist of the year on instagram if you just press on the hashtag and you see just a wall of you know uh john snow from the news from it's a bit from channel four john snow was um portraits of him and that some of them are amazing. I mean, some are, you've absolutely got the essence of Jon Snow in the most childlike rendering where I'm like, I actually think that's amazing because they've really got Jon Snow. And in others, I mean, my biggest objection is when people put up a photograph that they put yeah. a filter on and they, they upload comment. it saying, oh, you've really improved. And they go, thanks very much. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I look at their account and I'm like, this is you drawing. That's you putting a filter on a photograph. That's, you can't do that. That's ridiculous. And that's... That's social media, you know, where I just go, I don't care if people like or follow my stuff on social media. For me, the investment's to upload it and to go, that's yeah. where it is. Sits there, and then I make more, and I invest in myself. And I don't yeah. worry about the popularity online, because it's it's so weird to see people go, you've improved so much. And they're like, that's what? <laughs> because what are you looking at? This is not a drawing. That's a photograph of Jon Snow that's been made black and white done on the cartoon filter I think because it's got big spots where it's just contrast being picked up and exaggerated yeah. and then it's, I, I don't know I object to that I'm like that shouldn't be submitted that shouldn't be accepted in any way I think that some people did that even on the show where I objected to some I think I objected to something I forgot what it was and I remember telling my friend and she was like well good job you're not the adjudicator because I'd be kicking all kinds of people out go that's not a drawing go away <laughs> I honestly right I make sure that all of the images of my work that I upload online it's not edited that is what it looks like if you take a photograph of it because that's real um and I'm not ashamed to post any of it online yeah <laughs> So and to that's... actually cheat is not, it's just not of interest to anyone who's actually making art. And no. It's a weird kind of almost giving up where you just go, oh, I can just tweak this. It's kind of similar to what the dean of the university that we both attend said, that Picasso said, which I still don't believe that Picasso said. And he goes, what's the point in drawing anything when you can just cut it out of a magazine and use that? I don't know if Picasso ever said that, but that's the gist that I get where I'm like, well, because... There's actual merit to learning how to draw. Now, Picasso knew how to draw. So maybe he did have some kind of like, what's the point in me doing that? You know I can draw. Yeah. Now I'm going to cheat. And I'm like, absolutely. If you've paid your dues and you want to cheat, I'll just watch and go, it either works or doesn't work and good luck to you. But if someone doesn't draw and they're cheating, bless you. Um, the, uh, if someone doesn't draw, I'm either like, fair enough, you don't have to draw, but if they're pretending that they draw by cheating, then I just say that's it's not the type of cheating you want to aspire to, really. You want to aspire to cheat once you know you can do this without cheating, and you go, How, what can I do with the cheat instead? I suppose that could ha have value, I don't know. But then, if you're producing art to prove to other people that you can do it, why are you doing it? Like, no, I, no, I mean, oh, you mean the people who are cheating to sort of prove it that they've got no, better? Like, I understand with Picasso, like, if he did say that, um, but he, you know, if he if he was like, well, everyone knows that I can draw anyway, it's like, well, why are you trying to prove to everyone that you can? 
I don't think he was. That's the thing. I think that what he was... Sorry. So what I think his actual quote was, my guess when I looked it up was, he said, some artists ask why, I ask why not. And I think that he did that because he was maybe, when he was doing Cubism, or, uh, you know, like when he was really kind of pushing those angles and changing what you'd see, and including bits of print, like we were shown with that um, tablecloth piece that he did, which was lovely. Um, yeah. But it was kind of presented to us as valuable because he'd abandoned drawing, which I thought was a really stupid way into understanding a Picasso piece. It's like, oh no, he didn't care about drawing. It's like, Picasso was very good at drawing. He could draw, you know, incredibly well. Like there's yeah. a piece in Manchester where he drew, but anyway, it was a weird way into kind of saying this is an unorthodox piece that he'd made because he was saying, I ask why not? Why not skew these perspectives? And that's a journey where I think great i'm not his massive i'm not his biggest admirer of him as a person but as a an artist and an ego i mean i don't admire his ego but his ego drove his art exploration yeah i kind of do sit back and admire that it's still the way that we've shown that in university was again i, t I couldn't help but rebel against it and just art is non-art and non-art <laughs> is art <laughs> Shut up. Like Yeah. It was not only that, you're sort of saying everything except for art is art, including science. <laughs> it's just like Oh God. No, I don't agree. <laughs> I don't agree. I don't think artists are there. Scientists are there going, I'm such an artist. So, um yeah, it's just it's a weird way to approach teaching uh Picasso or non non figurative work, even though I would have loved to have done that. And what I ended up doing was, in response to it, was a minimalist piece based on my Wunderkammer, which is these shelves here to my right, and um, with certain objects that I put on them. And I basically just did a cut out. I'll put the picture up. It's a really basic. It was just kind of like I can't, I can't put more effort into this concept whilst you're bastardising what, what one of the great fine arts fine artists of the world said <laughs> i just i don't know i just kind of reject a lot of the the way in we're, we're being led in you know yeah it's a strange thing for me I, i've really struggled with that i have to admit it's I, I went there to really try and learn and grow and yet the way certain things are being presented i just bulk up immediately you know yeah it is um not what either of us expected no, no, I really wanted a nice um, studio where, you know, all sorts of things would happen, but people were like the artists that I've met out in the real world, mm -hmm. where they're respectful and nice of everyone's space and work. Yeah. And, you know, you wouldn't dream of disrespecting anyone's um, space or person. And uh, and yet when you answer it, it's kind of very high school. Like, you just, yeah. why are the mature students the most immature ones? Because I think all the... You know, younger students weren't so much the problem. Yeah. I wonder if that's always a thing or if it's, uh, depends. Maybe we just got lucky. Yeah, lucky. <laughs> it just felt, I don't know, it felt like really exciting when I first joined uni in the first year. I thought we've got such a mix of people with different talents and different interests, but everyone seemed to have such good vibes about them. And it just shows how you remove a little bit of this and you add a little bit of this and then it just ooh, yeah. collapses and melts. Yeah. Did you think so, um, yeah. did you think that you were gonna make any friends on the course or or not? No, I thought it would be I thought it'd be more rivalries, to be honest. I thought I'd be kind of, you know, I don't draw as much, I don't know as much as people, I've not gone through school and yeah. I've learned things on the job a little bit, you know, being a bit of a dull boy and going, yep, yeah, I can do that and then Googling it, <laughs> what is that? And then, you know, honestly doing it, like I don't bail on a job, but, um, so when I went into uni and realised like, we've not got much of a, a real, str I mean, I don't know, it was a slow realisation because I thought that, because Steve was there, we had this appearance of 
this is going to be our structure. Yeah. And we had John there, he's like, this is going to be our technique and our methodology. And then with the other tutors who were there, and I'm not going to start naming what I thought people introduced, but it was just a little bit less, uh, less of a benefit, I think, I got from the practice. And it wasn't even, a, it wasn't, it didn't even feel like a practice. It felt like, what, what are we actually doing? And what's the idea? And what's the influence? What's the movement? <coughs> Any of that. <coughs> With Steve, it was, this is some cubes that I'm putting up in a shape. The idea is to draw it. This is what you do for perspective. And now this is a complicated image to try and get that one point perspective and two point perspective to use for these complicated shapes stacked up. Yeah just to get the gist. Once you've got the gist, you can just run with it. And that's literally, I think, you know, all he said. You know, it wasn't even as forceful as I am that if you don't have this, you have a shaky foundation that you're building on. Now, if you never go near figurative work, you may not ever need it. But to not ever have that, I think is, it's a weird decision for someone to make. It's like me not to have clay. I've not made that decision and I was hoping before I joined uni that we'd cover that, that we'd go into ceramics. I wanted to throw some pots honestly, like I'd done it before in college, it was amazing, I absolutely loved it and I wanted to do it again. <laughs> I've never done it, I've, I know people as well close by who have invited me and <coughs> lovely and everything but obviously pandemic. Yeah. So one of those things, I, I can't be getting a, a kiln in my bedroom is enough already so it's, uh, that's something I should probably say is that as an introduction of who I am, I've been locked down in one room since the 12th of March 2020 post uh, reaction to the pandemic because of, um, because of certain autoimmune illnesses and just illnesses throughout my life where I know what it's like to talk, breathe through a pinhole and to kind of take shallow breaths and to never feel satisfied with the oxygen that you're receiving and, you know, for it to be uncomfortable. So my reaction yeah. was based upon my experience and yet I thought this isn't because it's going to affect me more than anyone else. I think that anyone that's going to affect is going to potentially experience what I have with asthma. Um, and until they've experienced it, they're not going to really know how much it's worth avoiding. And, um, and it's also, yeah. where, I don't know, it's just something that unlike asthma where I can just have my inhaler we haven't got that for long COVID, so if you've got long COVID, you could be, I don't know, yeah, suffering for a long time and for, you know, the rest of your life. I'm not sure at the moment. So my reaction to that has been quite dramatic, but I've tried not to police other people, you know, from my room. It's quite difficult. The idea of catching COVID as someone myself that is also asthmatic is absolutely terrifying. Um, my, you know, by no means is my asthma severe, um, but there have been times where, you know, I, I thought I was going to die. So the fact that COVID is something that could kill me, I'd rather not. And, you know, some people are like, oh, well, it, um, when it comes to asthma, they're like, oh, well, you're just asthmatic. And it's like, but until you have the sensation of not being able to breathe because you're <laughs> your literal like windpipe is it the bronchial oh right sorry yeah yeah like they are literally closing you'll never understand what it's like because you know you are suffocating and it's your body that's yeah. doing it to you it's not something external and it's terrifying yeah. so the thought of catching covid and not being able to yeah. breathe because of covid no thank yeah, you very much please thanks yeah it's it's a weird um... no it's a weird world of kind of disconnection from the risk where I'm initially concerned for people, but then after a while I just go, well, if everyone wants their freedoms and this country doesn't seem to have some, you know, good structured uh, guidelines and rules and leadership, then it's look out for yourself yeah. and look out for your loved ones and just try to give them, um, I don't know, I suppose it's uh, measured advice as opposed to kind of strong advice. Yeah. People don't like receiving advice. It's kind of measured by, in my view, I view this, well, to however you can delicately step out to people. My opinion is that it's possibly still a risk doing this or whatever, you know, and seeing 
yeah. what you can say to see if you can just introduce a, a, a level of caution. Yeah. So for um, for the first year of uni, we went into the the studio, and you know we had that studio experience. It wasn't a great studio, I might add. And then for the second year of university, which is the one we've just finished, um, did we? How long were we in uni for? Was it from October until March? I think yeah. Uh, I. Th I know that yeah. when I bailed, people were still going in maybe, yeah, it must have been March and then I think it was possibly only a week after I'd locked down, everything locked down, I think, for a little bit. Yeah, so we've been doing uni over Teams. Um, very weird experience for both of us, I think, because, you know, when, when you're doing... Well, any degree, really. When you're in any kind of education, you don't expect to, to do it from your own home. And for some people, that's a, a major issue. Um, for me, personally, I prefer it. That's my opinion. And I don't want to go yeah. back. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was a pretty odd experience to begin with. Because, you know, you were just at home. Um, and you'd have to upload images of your work and stuff so it's not like you could see any of it face to face which as an art student that's important Absolutely. because you can actually go up close and see the amount of detail that's there yeah. but that was just stripped away yeah. Um, yeah and now there's uncertainty as to you know what it is that we're actually doing next year yeah um, yeah uh... but I think we're both of the same opinion where we don't want to go back. No, no it's, I mean, yeah. if, the, if there was some kind of way that the risk, you know, say we were New Zealand or Australia where we'd kind of got the levels down so low that people were going into buildings because there was an actual procedure and enforcement in place where people respect it, then going back into the studio has kind of been ruined by what was happening towards the end of the first year, where um, there'd been a real shift in the dynamic of our studio and um, a rising, you know, kind of a bullying type of atmosphere and behaviour going on, a real toxic environment, yeah. as people would say, is because uh, <coughs> just people are left unchecked and the, the tutors, when they've been informed about these things, shrugging their shoulders and passing it off to say, you know, when it gets to a certain point, we'll lay down the law, but otherwise we're inclined to let people fix it in the studio, which sounded fair to me at first, but then when it continued, um, they literally just shrugged their shoulders and said, you know, whatever will be, will be, it'll fix itself. And it did to the yeah. extent that it's broken itself, where what you've got now is um, a weird, a weird studio, a weird studio group, because we don't share ideas, we've not been critiquing each other's work or giving each other, <laughs> you know, comments or... I mean, the comments that everyone gives are... It's like social media comments. Yeah, but it's, it's sort of, isn't it, kind of like remind you of the... I'm signalling where my allegiances are based on these comments, which is a real unhealthy studio compared to what we would have had if uh, that dynamic hadn't shifted, where we could all... Yeah kind of talk about each other's work and what we do and don't like in a way where we like the person that we're talking to so we're not trying to hurt their feelings we're trying to give them assistance I mean one of the students that left our studio I've kept friends with and her and I when she sends me work that she's been making I say to her do you want me to tell you what I don't like about it she said please do because nobody does that so I say to her I'll tell you what I don't like about it yeah. because there's things that I do like about it and I think both things are equally valuable. And that's a friendship, and that's what we should all have to some extent. And I would say none of us have, but very few of us have. Um, I think the only honest ones who do is that you and I will discuss things that we like, things that we appreciate. Uh, John has given yeah. me, John, uh, the student uh, from Rill, he's um, given me critique on a video in my uh, gallery, whatever they call it, on the on their platform online and um, yeah, and he thought that I'd taken that bad and I tried to reassure him you've given me a critique that is 
it's not a positive critique, but it's really positive for me to have that because you're giving me an honest bit of feedback about how you experience the work that I've uploaded. I really appreciate yeah. that. That's better than just saying, yeah, it's very good, that Simon, well done. I don't get much out of that, really. I mean, I get kind of the thing of it's nice to have people support you. That's great, and you do need that. But to have anyone say, like, I like the video, but, you know, this part where you had two journeys, it was just a bit much for me. I didn't concentrate. And it's worth saying that, because when I made this piece, it's the uh, cabinet, the minutes video is projected behind the cabinet. And, um, yeah. And that's a lot to kind of take in image-wise. And... Um, yeah, getting good feedback on that is invaluable. Yeah, but you know, for other students on our course, the the kind of feedback that you get, none of it is con constructive in any way whatsoever. Um, not going to name any names because you know, <laughs> still going to deal with them for a year. Um, but there is a particular piece that I did, insert image. Um, and the critique about it, or the opinion, if you will, was that it looked like a Disney illustration. Yeah. And then it went on to say, why don't you do like a Mexican Day of the Dead in Disney style? And this was because... Yeah, you... because my, yeah, my theme, uh, it was just after my grandma had passed away. And I think I finished it after my mum had passed away. They both passed within a month of each other. Yeah. And... In, I had done um, you know a whole piece a whole video um, of like for my grandma talking about her the kind of woman that she was um, and like I said before that kind of topic it, it can be overwhelming and it can be draining so I was like I can't do this I can't keep on with this I'm gonna have to do something more light-hearted so in this piece I looked at the important people in my life um, that are, you know, still here. Because a lot of the time we tend to dwell on the people that have passed away and we don't appreciate the people that are still alive. And that's so unfortunate, but it's true. Like, we, we all get so upset by the people that we've lost and we don't enjoy the time that we have with the people that are here. So I wanted to do this piece for all of the important people that are in my life. And I had said that. But the remark was, you should look into other cultures and how they view death. And it's like, well, what part of, I don't want to look at death anymore, <laughs> did you not hear? Yeah. Like, what part? All of it. They didn't hear it. They, but, didn't, they don't listen to what you say, which is something that I've noticed for not only what I've been doing, what you've been doing, but other students. Because we're on, uh, yeah. uh, not Zoom meetings, what's it called? It's uh, Teams. Teams. Yeah, Teams. Um, you can go back and watch the videos afterwards and uh, when I do that you can see the same thing happening with other students where they'll just kind of get a bit of a gist and go maybe this and uh, look at that and kind of go and do more research and it's not really a conversation where they understand the student or talk to them so yeah. I don't think we're the only ones who have felt unheard and unseen and felt like the suggestions that you're being given I mean I've not really been given many suggestions to be honest they've kind of not not done that for me but um it's because i started expressing problems i think with the, what they were saying but not about suggestions but just about the whole thing you know it just started to get to me a little bit so <clears throat> yeah sometimes if the suggestions from a tutor i don't know i suppose it's it's kind of like you want to feel like it's worth going down this path because that's something where you're going to produce work, you're going to read stuff, you're going to look it up, it's going to take time, you're going to write about it and then present it and it's going to probably take you elsewhere and it's built on this first step. So the first step, yeah. you've got to have a bit of confidence to take it and it's not going to be like, you know, I'm, it's a really scary step but it's something where if you're making art and you're trying to, you're trying to be honest, it's, I don't know, I've really struggled I really struggled where I don't feel like they kind of get anything that I've sort of said just like with you and they just kind of go well this makes me think of this so go be busy yeah mm. weird unfeeling and incompassionate kind of feel for it, of a course for people who you'd imagine would be quite sensitive because they're artists 
you'd think that uh, they'd understand that it's a lot of feelings and a lot of truth and a lot of you know exposing vulnerable yeah. sides of who you are. And I've had no inclination to do any of that. <laughs> so I think you're very brave with your work that you explore because they're not mature enough to process it. You know? Like I said, though, unless it's like really deep and unless I'm really passionate about it, I won't do it. Like I tried, um, I tried to do a painting and it's still unfinished because I started it and I was like, I'm not invested in this. And I just, I haven't touched it since because my brain just wouldn't allow me to do it anymore. So it has to be like really personal to me. Mm. Otherwise, I don't give a shit. <laughs> That's very fine art though. That's true. It's, you don't want to be, you know, manufacturing pieces saying like, well, no. it's just my job. So this is where orange goes and it's where the purple bit goes. You want to kind of feel it and actually have passion in each piece. And like yeah. John said, it's you get into that kind of place where you know what you're doing and you just want to channel as much as you can into that creative process. Um, yeah, it's it's tricky. I mean, for me, I I can really relate because I don't really finish much work and uh, I don't really start much work at the moment. Everything's a bit kind of, what can I do to do anything? You know, just so I'm not doing nothing. Um, yeah. I mean, I've talked to you a few times about how the thing I'm more inclined to do at the moment is to make a cartoon, which I'm really still very tempted to delve into, but it's a massive investment and I'm not on an animation course. And if I can get leeway to do it for the third year, I think I've discussed with you that I think I'd still like to dive into it. And I don't know what cartoon yeah. I'll be doing, you know, but it's a weird, it, it just shows how mashed up my head is with, I went into the university to do drawing, painting, sculpting, any kind of creating yeah. where, you know, if it was a load of halogen light bulbs and they go, this is your material, I would have loved to have kind of gone, right, I've got the safety equipment, I've got the space to use it, let's construct something, photograph it, see if we can plug bits in to make them work. And it would have been all types of artwork that I would have liked making, but they don't really seem to have a, an environment where you've, you've got either freedom or, or kind of support to no. do anything like that. I mean, the younger students, some of them have seem really nice and seem quite, you know, talented in, in uh, what they're doing. And yet I still, do, you know, can't get that friendship with them where we all have trust because it's been so eroded now by what's happened in uni. Yeah. I Very feel strange. like uni as well, for me, definitely dampens my creative process. Because, like, yeah, I get ideas while I'm in uni. But the fact that I have to show absolutely everything that I do, my brain doesn't work that way. And because I haven't shown how I've gotten to where I went, it causes a lot of conflict like between my tutors and myself because they're like, well, we don't understand. And it's like, well, I can tell you my idea. I can tell you how I got there. But as soon as I have to put it down on paper, I lose interest like it's yeah. just gone yeah. and unless you do that unless you have you know your sketchbook filled with everything like you know you fart and you put it in there that you can <laughs> farted that kind of you know unless you do that they you you don't get a high mark no. you your marks are docked because of it because you haven't shown your creative process and it's like mate my creative process is all in my head okay yeah. and that's it like that's it <laughs> i can really relate again like, yeah go on. yeah but they're like sketchbooks are so valuable it's like for who <laughs> not for me <laughs> yeah for them like, you say this is what we did we told us to do that <laughs> i could create the most in detailed painting that they had ever seen and if i hadn't shown how i'd gotten there I won't get a high grade for it. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah, it's strange. They really want you to kind of go explain everything to us. Like, you're the tutors. Aren't you supposed to be embedding in us some kind of like, this works, like what John did at the beginning and what Steve did. This works, yeah. try this. Because I've not really had that for anyone else. And then when they say, explain how you've got there, similar to yourself, I wanted to make a film and I have got enough footage of me sat here doing nothing in this yeah. exact spot where I thought, should I just show them that and go, this is where I'm thinking. I'll be watching something. 
but I'll be thinking about how this person's done that and it'll kind of loosely relate to how I do whatever. I can't write it down. Do you want me to write down when I heard, you know, so-and-so say this in his cartoon, I thought, it kind of reminds me of the way I approach this could be more like how they approach that with a bit of finesse. It doesn't translate on paper. You've got to kind of work it out. And when you when you put it on paper, it's dry. And it's not something that... Yeah. Even when you start doing it, you're just like, this isn't the process. I'm doing a superficial stamp for them to just go, yay, there you go. You get a mark for that one. <laughs> yeah. And, like, my thought process is all over the place anyway because of my ADHD. Like, you know, anyone that has ADHD understands. I don't have one single thought going at one time. A lot of the time, there's so many of them just like bouncing off one another. So for me to have to put that down on paper, it wouldn't make any sense. It just wouldn't. You'd read it and be like, what happened? This looked like you had a breakdown. Okay, what happened? And so I have to go from, so I work backwards, okay? I, I produce a finished piece if that's how you want to view it like I did a painting it's not finished yeah but sure and then I have to work backwards and be like right okay I've done this how can I like can I make so up as to how I got there yeah retroactively Maybe. build what a lesser version of this is and then what that could come from you know let's build this yeah. now because they're gonna want to see it <laughs> yeah yeah and, you know, if I had to wait until I'd done all my sketchbook work before I did a painting, I wouldn't yeah. paint. That's There's no way you'd paint. Yeah, if you were, like, busy there, like, going, oh, I've got to get the tone right in this on this thumbnail. I see people doing it online, and I just think, how, how could you possibly, how could you spend so much time in preparation for one piece when yeah. you can work that out either on the canvas or digitally so much quicker? So much just, yeah. like, put that colour in, put that tone in. I don't. I can't even be bothered doing it digitally because I'm like, you figure that out on the canvas. You can paint over it. The paint's yeah. still wet while you're painting. Why? Why so much? I don't know. But I get that they want it to be a big structure. But sometimes I don't know. Sometimes you just think if that's every artist that is valid. You know, like every valid fine artist is a structure of little ideas leading to this piece. <clears throat> then I think we need another subsect of fine art where the artist can be a bit freer than what they're describing. Not everyone is neurotypical, okay? And that's the issue because yeah. they focus on neurotypical people and they're like, you can do this because you're neurotypical and your brain works like a normal person. And then, you know, some neurodivergent comes over and is like, oh yeah, I want to do art. And they're just like, um, you have to follow the same process because we've already implemented it and we're not going to change it for you because we don't understand. And it's like, yeah, like yeah, really there, bad. there are probably so many artists, right? That just don't have a sketchbook. Okay. Wow, they they probably, you know, go on their stroll and, you know, something happens and they're like, I've just had an idea. You know, like a light bulb moment. And then they do it and that's yeah. it. They just do it. And that's yeah. how my brain works. Because like, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's like a tumbleweed and I have no idea. And then I'll have one conversation with one person. And I'm like, this has just cascaded into a mass of ideas that I could do. And then I just do it. Yeah. It's not like a, I don't know, yeah, I suppose it's not something you can force, is it? It's just something no. which naturally occurs in its own, you know, storm. But I mean, it's, I mean, if you don't mind sharing, when we would set a, an amount of reading to go through and you yeah. spoke to them about this saying, as somebody who suffers with dyslexia, I'm not going to be able to cover this reading. No, it wasn't only that. Okay, so I'm dyslexic. It has impacted my life tremendously okay if you read any of my work doesn't seem like i'm dyslexic i use grammarly because i'm smart like that um however the issue was my adhd okay i got diagnosed with adhd apparently when i was 16 but no one told me so it was literally university when i went back to the doctors um and they mentioned it um i'm on medication now not that you'd be able to tell um and <laughs> we had this reading group, right, and it was with the Dean, okay? It didn't contribute to 
anything like didn't go towards the degree they were like yeah we're gonna read this overly complicated text so first of all I'm dyslexic okay reading any text is hard second of all I have ADHD reading anything is impossible so <laughs> I it's especially said, dense it's worth saying that the, the yeah. text is especially dense on purpose by design to be academic so that's yeah. what we want you to read it's overcomplicated for the sake of it being overcomplicated and this was like a six week thing and um, the dean he was like so Jamie what are you going to get out of it and I was like I'm going to be honest nothing because I'm not going to do it <laughs> and I explained why and he went so are you saying you're going to be excited for it? No, that's not what I said. I said I'm not going to do it. Like, I literally just said I'm not going to do it, okay? What? Um, and then I went to my other tutor, who apparently is her husband. I didn't know that um, at the time. Do now. And um, I had said to her, I was like, listen, okay, I can't even read for pleasure. I used to be able to. I can't now because as soon as I get half a page in, my brain goes, like, just stop. It could be the most engaging thing I've ever read in my life, but because it's just words, I'm just looking at words, can't visualise anything, I have aphantasia, which doesn't help. So it doesn't happen, and I said that to my tutor, I was like, listen, no. And her suggestion was, maybe if you try and do a little bit of reading in the morning. So yeah, uni's rubbish. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, okay. Um, on uni's rubbish, life sucks, and here we are. <laughs> I mean, you know, clinging on to the life that's still left and um, uni's two years deep, so might as well just ride out the last third year. Yeah. As far as an introduction episode for ourselves, though, I have to admit it's... Um, I've got more of a background in comic books and I've done a bit of animation, it's worth saying, so that's still far more real to me than... Unfortunately, painting yet, because I've just not done enough painting. I've not had enough time with the painting tutor or been kind of helped that way, and I'd like to. Um, but yeah, as far as, you know, that type of thing, I suppose if we're introducing who we are in this podcast as ourselves, it's worth saying that um, the art is still... I make more art when we're break, broken up from uni. Like when yeah. we're kind of... When we finished second year, I started making drawings again and painting again. Um, yeah. So I think that's why it's a difficult, a bit of a depressing thing to reflect upon. Um, sometimes the university thing. Anything positive to say about it? <laughs> Let's see if we can turn it around. We got to meet each other in uni. That's very true, actually, yeah. That is very true. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a nice building. Yeah. Yeah, building. Um, yeah. We had some first fun conversation. There, yeah, the first conversation that we had was about working in retail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'll be uh, that'll be extrovert me that I kind of put on as a bit of a, a bit of a facade when I went into uni because I was kind of I've always been quite an introverted person, which probably comes across more in these podcasts than what I did at uni because I was all like Mr like hey I may as well be this tutor's assistant because I was trying yeah. to make everything you know like a family. I To be honest I didn't think I was actually going to make friends in uni and then we had a conversation about Sainsbury's and I was like I've spoken to this person now. <laughs> That's enough to My, be a friend. <laughs> yeah um, and then I showed you a few cool places in town and then it kind of just like spiraled from that point. Yeah. Yeah. Real uh, good ally to have, and it's it's worth doing if you're if you are going into art school, or um, or if you're in art school and going through what we are. If you've got any friend who you can trust there, just remember that's you're worth as much to them as they are to you, and it's it's a real ally through difficult, challenging uh, processes of trying to learn around sometimes some unpleasant people. Um, even if they don't mean to be. Moral of the story is you need to get your own studio, buddy. <laughs> and on that note, everyone, <laughs> that is episode number one. Thank you for listening, and this was Studio Buddy, doing a podcast, a little 
Thanks for watching. Thank you. Bye.